second. Hi, this is Paula Glory, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole because we like to go into topics more deeply. As my audience knows, I'm very picky about my guests. They have to be guests that also want to go into topics more deeply because who wants to push somebody into something? So I'm very happy today to have as a guest Dr. John Quirchi. Thank Did you. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, Quirchi? that's perfect. Uh, his family is from Florence, Firenze. That's the Italian name, Quirchi. So um, I want to tell you that I was so impressed with your interview yesterday with Alan Steinfeld because I have been studying low-level radiation and how radioactivity, it turns out, is almost like a vitamin. We need more of it. And there are doctors who have benefited from it. They've seen remarkable things happen. But they're terrified to go out and use it on anybody else except themselves and their closest family because it's against protocol. And you were talking about your spiritual revelations and understandings, and I went to your website, and um, Dr. Querchi's website is whereisbuddhababy.com. I highly recommend you to look at that website. Thank you. And I found that you really, you really walk your talk. So you've heard the interview that was just done. I was a guest on DeAndrea's show. How do you, as a medical doctor who, who diagnoses a disease, how do you then apply the remedy? If the remedy is spirituality, what is the problem? Well, there's a uh, disconnect between the science of medicine and the, um, I, I guess, the spirituality of medicine uh, in the training. Uh, people today uh, go into medicine, and uh, in the training process, they're, they're taught not to be creative, not to be, uh, not to stand out. There's tremendous peer pressure. And... Um, they're the, taught not to stand out. That's right. Really? Uh, they really... Um, so you're kind of referring to kind of the leadership that a doctor needs to take in leading his patient through the disease? Well, uh, the leadership is, is a protocol. And the protocols are all laid out by the um, organization of medicine. And more and more and more, you can't deviate from those protocols. More and more and more. I mean, you're chastised for it. Of course, you're ostracized, you're chastised. Insurance companies uh, don't want to hear it. And um, lawyers want to hear it. Lawyers want to hear it? Sure, because when you, when you uh, go off the beaten path, then you're going into a very uh, unsafe territory in the legal standpoint. And government regulating agencies don't want to hear it. But from a legal point of view, the, uh, the determinations are made on courts that only admit certain evidence. Well, of course. Of course. So they're not informed. No, the they, courts they aren't go informed, so the judges have to rule on in, with incomplete knowledge because the knowledge is suppressed. Well, um, it's not encouraged, put it that way. Um, you're encouraged to walk the walk and talk the talk of the medical community, which is very conservative, which is very... Um, they're, they're not free thinkers. They have to really, um, if you're an incredibly aggressive, wonderful surgeon who's willing to take on very difficult cases, but your morbidity and mortality is higher than a very conservative surgeon who only takes on the very fundamental cases, you will be in trouble. Oh, you mean it's like like a batting average? Of course. Wow, I never thought about that. Yeah. So somebody so, would turn down a surgery that doesn't have a good chance of survival. Absolutely. They want to take the winners. And maybe if the surgeon was a real surgeon that wasn't thinking about the odds, he might take it on and, and actually help the person. Because right. Simoncini, who talks about cancer being a fungus, says you have to take it out by its roots. 
So he does have a model open for, for surgery, but he's just saying there's probably more effective ways if we could get the full force of science uh, on, on the track of where the evidence really seems to be going, that, that it's an infection. But, but actually, your revelations were beyond all of this. It had to do with the spiritual dimension that was well. coming into... Because he says that Simoncini was saying that we're not taking into account the whole range of what a human being is, from the physical and the, uh, the organs and then the neurological arrangement all the way down to the spiritual and the soul. So he said that a patient could come in that is legitimately troubled by a moral dilemma, and that moral dilemma is going to figure on to the body. But when the doctor-patient relationship is relegated way to the sideline by looking on the body in a reductionist way, then the doctor never has a chance to say something like, put your affairs in order. That doesn't have to be a bad uh, diagnostic uh, determination. It's just saying, this is, this is the evidence of where things are going. Maybe a person could put things so in order that they radically change. Now, I think you had a radical transformation yourself, mm -hmm. and so maybe we could highlight that. Well, it, it, it's like uh, um, obesity. Uh, there's a million diets out there. There's a million diet pills out there. There's a million exercise programs out there. We're, we're not really getting to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is why are we obese? And the, the reason is, is because we feel unsafe, because we're trying to fill ourselves with something. Why are we drinking too much uh, alcohol? Uh, the reason is we're trying to be numb for a reason. Uh, why are we using street drugs? Once again, we're trying to be numb for a reason. So treating uh, an addict um, with methadone isn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. All it's doing is sort of saying, well, now we legalized it. Now we allowed you to be a, an addict in our system. But we never went back to find out why they want to be numb. Right. Or the person who uh, goes through these grueling, brutal diets, loses weight, or gets a gastric bypass, which is even, it's pathetic, uh, gets a gastric bypass, and then eats their way through the bypass. We never got to the root of the problem. Why do you have the obesity? Uh, maybe you have something empty inside. Maybe it's a love issue. It's an intimacy issue. Why don't we help them from a spiritual standpoint instead of rearranging their intestines anatomically? Um, we see a... Or in the case of alcohol, what would it, what would it be? I well, mean? once again, being, being numb. The person wants to be numb. Uh, well, why do you want to be numb? Why do you, why do you feel uh, like you have this emotional pain that's hurting you so badly that you don't want to feel anymore? So maybe we should discuss, once again, it comes down to an issue of, of love. There's something missing. Or you take um, labels in the psychiatric realm. We label someone oppositional defiant disorder we reinforce it with social security disability and with medications to tranquilize them. Why are they angry? Why don't we ask that question? What made them angry? Uh, how can we help them with their anger? How can you get, help them get in touch with themselves? Don't reinforce the problem. Um, and there's, there's many, many, many uh, diseases and entities like that. You take someone with heart disease, their medical community is willing to recognize now that stress causes heart disease. What stress? What does it mean? Oh, it's our lifestyle. What is our lifestyle? I mean, you could be in the middle of New York, the busiest, most, I guess, stressful city in the world, and be very calm. Mm -hmm. And you could move very rapidly, but you can move calmly. So maybe the stress is what's inside us. So maybe the treatment for heart disease is to prevent it from happening by helping people deal with their anxieties in life.
And what are anxieties in life? It's their chronic fear. And what is chronic fear? Inability to trust. And what is inability to trust? Inability to love oneself. So what about the case of the show we just did about the inability to trust our judicial system? That, that, that was shocking to me. I, I had no idea. And I started to, as I started to find out more about it, it started to throw me on my spiritual knowledge from the past that never made much sense. It's, it, you know, it's like information that was given but didn't, wasn't the right time starts to kick in. And I found that the more forgiving I was, the more abuse I could see. And the more abuse I could see, the more it would draw on me or sort of demand that there has to be yet more spiritual fortitude or, or, or nourishment welling forth. That's what I was curious ab about in your case. Like right now, a lot of people are upset at doctors. They, there's a lot of information going around about cures that are suppressed, and then they're, they're blaming the doctors. And yet, when they have a problem, the first thing they'll do is listen to whatever their doctor says. Because they're and scared. And, and the doctors, too, are scared, mm -hmm. right, to, to say anything other than that. So doctors are terrified. Yeah. How, how do you, that's, that's what excited me about the show. It seemed as though you wanted to also work on doctors. Well, it, it, it's not how only medicine. How do you bring that spiritual? It's fear. We have to overcome our own fear. How did you overcome your fear? Um, I got tired of being fearful. Really? I was fatigued by it. I didn't want to live a life of fear. It's a choice you have to and, make. And you said you had how many employees? 26. 26. And see, when, when I was in the control room, the way I was with someone else, we heard it differently than how Alan heard it. He, Alan was saying, so you decided you have to take care of yourself in the heck with 26 people who have to get a job if you quit. Well, not, not You'd true. said, what I heard you say was that you will have better jobs mm -hmm. if, if I can follow my heart. Right. Has, and they did have better jobs. They all got great jobs. Did, did they stay in the medical healing or not no. necessarily? The, the head of my laboratory is a principal of a uh, high school outside of Philadelphia now. He went back to school. And he's happier. Oh, he's much happier. He calls me all the time. He called me two days ago. And he said, I never would have done that before because I would have stayed right where I was at. He said, was I satisfied there? Sure, I was satisfied there. But was I really fulfilled there? No. But when I saw, well, okay, since my job is going, I'm going to go back to school. Right. And uh, he's a very happy uh, principal today. And everyone did very well. Um, and, and, and I helped them, too. It wasn't I'd like, like to I see you get a them. clinic of double 26 people because there's great medical knowledge. We need doctors to study things. When, when, when this radioactive stone, uh, you know, by keeping it close to my body, I was on the computer 13 hours a day editing and editing and editing. And everyone said, it's bad for your eyes, the computer. Well, pretty soon I said, I'm not looking for my reading glasses. I realized, I don't need my reading glasses. So I had records with my eye doctor from 97. And then again in 2006, when I was looking at the sunrise over the river, and saying some mantras, there was some small improvement, but nothing like this. So, and as I got him on my show, I realized that the eye chart that you use is only one of 20 eye tests. There's so many aspects of sight. It, it's so rich and full what this, what this man knows. And if he was free not to be bogged down by insurance and, you know, he could, he could make, huge contributions. We need doctors. I mean, I'm glad yeah. your other guy is, is happy doing another profession, but I would love to see you employ twice as many people in the, in the healing and medical fields. Well, what I find more interesting now is to empower people. Okay. Letting them know what they can do. And, and not, how do I say this? Not by telling them, but by showing them. You don't tell people what to do makes people more fearful, makes them more dug in. But by just leaving, li living a life that's fearless, other people look at you and go, hmm, that's interesting. Let me look at this. And I, I think that's what's powerful. 
And when you're in a large city like Manhattan, where there's so many people, so many people in New York City, uh, it's amazing how many people you can touch in one day. Because there's a lot of people. And everyone is interested. So whether it's in your rela romantic relationships or your business relationships or your whatever, all of life is about relationships. And all of life, no matter what advice you give to people, uh, whether you're a lawyer or an accountant or an architect or whatever you are, there has to be some philosophy behind it. You have to sort of let people know where you're coming from and the passion you have, and they have to bring out their passion. And then it's fun. And uh, you know, it's a hard thing today. Everyone wants to walk the line because they're afraid. We live in a society dominated by total fear. What's the most rewarding healing you've had that you've been able to facilitate? Um, I'm not sure. The, the, the greatest word I ever said, someone said to me, and this happened a few times, but a very, very successful person who has everything going in the right direction for them, for some reason said to me in a very calm, quiet voice, I'm filled with fear. I have so many fears. And didn't look at me. And I just waited a moment. And I leaned over and I said, and that's OK. That's all I said. And it was incredible the response I got out of that a week later just because I said it was OK. If I said anything else, the person would have got dug in and built a more strong wall around them. But I think this person really heard that and realized that it is OK, because we all too. she was accepting. Did you connect accepting. him to his soul more, do you think? Yeah, she, she accepted she. her own wholeness. And Wholeness means accepting the dark side of us with the light side of us. There is no perfection in nature. But in order to be whole, we have to know our whole self and to embrace both sides. And the dark side, to embrace it, look it in the eye and say, I'm going to let you go with love. But when you're fighting it and resisting it and kicking it and shoving it and suppressing it, all you do is fights back and wins, bites you. It haunts you. So, but no one really wants to be controlled. So their way of rebellion is when you give them the answer like, why don't you just get tough? Why don't you just change? Why don't you just kick butt? People don't want to hear that. So they get more dug in and they go into denial. So how, d how can we... Un Dug in the medical system. If if you have a, by not a attacking it, a brilliant. Okay, by not attacking it. By just showing people how you do it and changing one person at a time. That's what true rebellion is. Changing one person at a time by example, and that one person changes one person at a time by example. I mean, it took a hundred years for us to get in this predicament. Which it's predicament? the predicament where medicine is today, where um, it's just become one big factory. It's Detroit. It's, it's the car industry. It's Detroit? It's Detroit. Medicine has become the car industry. It took 50 years for the car industry to collapse. You know, the Vedas or the Ayurveda, Mm -hmm. You know, the Indian system of knowledge? Mm -hmm. You know, the first tenet is that the doctor doesn't take money mm -hmm. for treatment. Mm -hmm. It's so, so tricky, that, you know, about not taking money because um, perhaps they would be the Brahmins and they're not considered the, the, the warriors or the, uh, the kings and the, the, the rulers of society. They're the ones that are the highest caste, but they're not known as the richest. Mm -hmm. that are supposed to chant the Vedas and to keep the, 
the knowledge of the harmony of nature and of life lively. And the body is part of that. So it's, it's part of the same body of knowledge. So I think it's not just 100 years old. I think it's been, it's a, it's a constant problem that if you've got an industry, you've got a corporation, you've got shareholders, and you've got to make these profits, mm -hmm. then you start looking on to profitable therapies. Of course. And, and that's what I think Simoncini was saying, is then you take the doctor-patient relationship and you relegate it to the side, where Absolutely. the doctor is afraid to, uh, to make a determination based on his intuition or wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had a, a mammogram that had calcium deposits, and they wanted me to do a biopsy. And at first, I didn't have the money to do it. I just waited. And then uh, there was some concern for me, and something opened up where I could be part of the Manhattan Breast Project. So I went down to a Chinese a, a hospital in Chinatown. And a surgeon put her hands on my breast, and she goes, I don't feel anything. And as soon as she said that, I felt energy from her hands. I felt the healing, and I had the knowledge in my head. It, I was looking for somebody with wisdom. With, with experience that, that could make sort of an educated determination. You know, like you go to a stockbroker and you're trying to decide what stock to, you know, you want sort of their wisdom and experience. And you usually ad admire somebody who's older, who's been at it longer, like lawyers. They're more valuable as they get older because they've had more experience. Then she looked at my mammogram and she saw that it had been one year since I'd had it. Then you could feel the robot coming out in her. You know, she was, the, the connection was broken, and she was just parroting what she was supposed to say. And I really f felt sorry for her. So she sent me over to the radiologist, and then we made an agreement to whittle down, I don't know, 20 shots down to just three, and with an agreement that if anything was bad, you know, I would come back. And uh, basically, you had the radiologist here, you had the surgeon there, and the only way I could get a unifying field uh, opinion was to write letters to a corporation, and I was answered by attorneys. And uh, all I wanted to do was put the diagnostic on YouTube, on the internet. I would point the camera at the white screen. They'd say whatever it was. Totally freaked them out, the whole system. And when I finally complained and said, why am I talking to lawyers and not a doctor, I finally got a doctor to sign a letter. To, he wrote the letter. And the only reason I couldn't take the diagnostic determination and put it on the internet was because it would be too chilling. That's what they said. And that, so in other words, I had to be in the room, kind of beat up by a doctor who himself has been beaten up. You know? That's the whole system, though. Yeah. It's a system it's a for system. everything today. Everyone is beaten up. So how do we break that cycle? and take back the power we need. Because I'm not a doctor. I haven't studied. I don't pretend to have studied those things. I, I just sort of have this survival gut sense of to sort of avoid something that's got a lot of money in it. I don't know. I mean, you have to change the system of commerce in the Western world, primarily the United States. And. Um, but I think you could get doctors to stand up for, for their what their eyes are seeing, the evidence. I think it's going to be very hard, especially for the younger doctors, because they've never tasted the freedom of what it used to be like. Not that it wow. was perfect. It's tragic. But it's almost like um, being brought up um, in the commerce of the Russian satellites. Their whole idea of what work was was totally changed. And when they did get their freedom from Russia, they were overwhelmed by what the West expected of them. Right. So uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I just felt a wave of grief when you said that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's About true. About the young I'm not doctors sure. who haven't even known yeah, the heights of known what anything. a doctor patient relationship could be. Yeah, there is none today. There, there really isn't any. It's, it's, it's robotic medicine. It's McDonald's. There are some doctors doing remarkable things. Oh, sure there are. But 
Well, I guess they're, if they're you're not the majority, they're not, they're not the, the huge numbers. The ones that usually have a little more guts aren't doctors because they don't have the standing to lose. But, you know, one lady in Pennsylvania was talking about getting a radioactive stone and putting it on a lady's breast that had been oozing from February to July, and it turned overnight. And then within two weeks, there was pink skin healing up, indicating that it, they, they just hit it right. There was enough natural, low-level radioactivity to have, uh, in this case, the, the uh, understanding is, the hypothesis is that the fungus in her breast perished. But Simoncini in Italy, there was one lady that went and had it quite advanced and quite a bit of chemotherapy. He wanted to do an elaborate surgery where he'd go in through the belly button and sort of suck it out. But you have to get it out by the roots because like a fungus has sort of a web quality. If you affect it one place, it sort of retreats back, you know, mm -hmm. regroups and then can come out again. That's the fungus theory. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are other theories, but that sure. seems to be... That makes a lot more sense than the genetic theory that says that the DNA has uh, been damaged and it's just going out of control and it's making new cells. Uh, Simoncini was saying that's like saying your mouth that's been eating food all its life all of a sudden starts chewing on your hand. You know that it, mm -hmm. it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Do you enjoy medicine? Oh, I, I, I do. I do enjoy uh, a medicine. Um, I just um, would not enjoy being a private practitioner, which I did for 19 years anymore. But in 19 years, you must have had a lot of rewarding experiences. Oh, oh I did, but it changed. It, it became so difficult to deal with the bureaucracy. To be in private practice? To be in private practice. Um, and right now, I, I basically I don't deal with the insurance companies and tell me what you do what you I'm like. an emergency room physician you're still in the emergency yeah. room mm -hmm. wow that's so. stressful isn't it no because you're allowed to treat people I'm doing a um, interactive discussion November 1st in Union Square at the Tao Yoga and Tai Chi studio from 5 at night to 7 it's free Everyone's welcome. Um, and it talks about the journey from love, or from fear to love. One big choice, one very difficult choice people have the opportunity to make, and a bunch of little baby steps. Hi, this is Paula Glory, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole because we like to go into topics more deeply. Today, I'm going to go farther down the rabbit hole with uh, two guests that I've had recently. Uh, on my far left is Deandria, and Deandria is the uh, producer of the show, The Real News. So thank you for joining me on the show, Deandria. Thank you for having me. I'm so proud to be on your show. Oh, great. And we have John Quirchi. Uh, who is a doctor, and he's got his fabulous website called Where'sBuddhaBaby.com, right? Where is Buddha Baby? That's correct. Thank How did you. you get that name? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I came up with it. I guess um, I, I like the Buddhist philosophy, and that sort of triggered the idea. And I was traveling a lot, so uh, it was sort of to talk about my travels and talk about Oh, uh, you're in my journey, I guess. Right, right. The, talk about in Thailand that that case that you had where the person told you to remember an Alan show. He said, "Use your intuition." Or oh yeah, in Cambodia. Yes, yes, yes. I had a um, um, a person, sort of a guide in Cambodia, and uh, I said, "Where do you go at night? Is there a part of?" town that people, you know, have fun, party, and whatever. He says, oh, yeah. So he tells me. I said, well, but to go from that part of town to where the hotels are, there's all these dirt roads, and there's no lights, and it's rather desolate, and people stay out pretty late there. Is it safe? He says, follow your own intuition. 
Uh, that was amazing. What do you think about that, Dan? Well, that, that's what I pretty much was doing when I told you on a previous program we did about listening to your inner voice. After a uh, tragedy struck my family um, and I started listening to my inner voice, um, I, people were telling me, why don't you stop your activism because you're getting deeper and deeper in trouble. But my inner voice was telling me to listen to Kathy O'Brien's words, which were, instead of running and hiding from the evil, you go back at them, and you keep going back at them. And that's pretty much what I did. I followed, I just said, no, I'm being driven to keep fighting. And while I was in jail... Uh, I don't think it was Kathy O'Brien. I think it was your inner voice. It, it was my inner voice, but I listened. See, I wasn't listening before to my inner voice. I wasn't paying attention. Oh, you mean if the, the before signs of pedophilia that your husband had, I, that you weren't listening? I wasn't listening. That's understandable. Nobody I, wants to even face Most women like don't that. want to, but now I listen. I'm different. I'm not the same person as I was. That's why I haven't even found a boyfriend in all these years is because my inner voice says, don't bother with him again. You know, one date and they never make date number two. I'm look, I know what I'm looking for and my inner voice has told me what I'm looking for. And unless I find that perfect guy who treats me not like a princess, but a queen, then <laughs> he's not in my life. <laughs> a queen. And I've had that. Now, now you and know, I'll treat him like a king. Now, you know, kings and queens today, politically... I meant a good queen. No, no, I understand, but, but I want to go into this because where I've been getting a lot of energy lately and inspiration for all the grief that we see, because you've heard a couple of our shows and some of the things that happens in public access, and then once you're on the Internet, people like Patience Poet, people... You know, there's another lady who was abused by her own lawyer. You know, and it's just tragic, tragic cases. Other people who get their houses taken away in court, they just take the whole house away. Um, is the Mahabharata, it's India's epic poem. It's the Bollywood kind of style. It goes 79 episodes. And it's about a great war and what happened to, you know, what, what led up to it. And the idea of kings and queens in an ideal society is somebody who takes responsibility for the society. The king in a male way and the queen in a female way. And I've often thought that if you were a queen and you really cared about how you looked, your makeup and your clothes and your house and your garden, wouldn't you also, if a, if a visiting dignitary was coming to your country, wouldn't you think of the entire country? and the well-being of every member of that society as being part of your garment. So does it have to be that kings and queens is a bad concept? And, and who's stepping up to the plate? Like you heard the show I did with John about uh, medical doctors, how, they're, how they're, they're caught. They may, I mean, when I told somebody once that I'd heard that their doctors who are not doing chemotherapy themselves or some, you know, in these cases I've heard of, and they use radioactive stones on themselves and their close family, and someone said, well, how can they sleep at night and continue to give out a lethal therapy? And, and I said, that's my concern, is those doctors. And someone said, Paula, our karma is just to give this knowledge out, and that's their karma, that's the doctor's karma. And I said, just a second, if someone comes to you sick, you know, one of the symptoms is they can't sleep. So whether the person can't sleep because he has cancer or he can't sleep because he's a doctor that maybe knows he's sitting on a cure that he's feeling bound with, you know. So that's why I'm saying we need more nobility of, 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 of character, people to, to step forward fearlessly. And maybe the kings and queens risk being deposed if they were too bold, I don't know. They would end up executed. Well, you, you have that's a revolution? A that's a fact. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting thought, that Marie Antoinette saying let them eat cake was actually a good person and not a decadent person. Right. That, that could be, because I actually heard one of the Tsars was sitting on zero-point energy. He was going to release that. But I'm sure you don't know a whole lot about Ross Perot, but he was 100% honest, and he was going to change his country, and 
put it in the correct direction, and he was threatened uh, severely. So the media, controlled by the government, and I didn't have a program at the time, uh, the media was uh, making fun of him, laughing at him, calling him a chicken, so people would believe what they're hearing on the media and walk away from him. So he didn't die. However, I went to his house. I, I am the person who got him to run in New York. It's a long story. I don't Ross want to go. Ross Perot? Ross Perot. Really? Me. Just me. Singular. One person. I caught a conspiracy. I Western Union him about it. And he immediately got people, they were blocking him from getting on the ballot here. So in any event, I went to his house. I figured I did something for him. Maybe he could help me. And I was so intimidated. He lives on a regular block uh, in Houston, Texas, just a, a tree-lined street like normal people live. Just Is because she he, asleep? He doesn't, yes, she passed out. Wow. Just because millionaires... Uh, n normally, l normally live in mansions. He doesn't. He just lives in a nice house. But he was the only one with this uh, army barbed wire fence around the entirety of the property with those barbed wires around it. And he had a black mailbox that was this big, no number on it. And I felt so intimidated. I, I never knocked on the door. I was just so afraid. His fear brought fear unto me. This is prior to my reading Conversations with God. All right. So let's make that the rest of the topic because we were talking about fear and how children need to be not raised in fear. And then we'll go with conversations. Or we'll yeah, what you said was so powerful, so absolutely powerful. And people don't realize this, is the energy they put out. So he put out the energy of fear. Even though he's this confident, brilliant billionaire, he had an energy of fear. And he scared you away. So what would he attract? He would attract similar people to him who would feel very comfortable with the fear theory. People mm. who live similar lives. You mean, you and mean the, the protection, protection. The It's just wire. like in New York City. There's these very wealthy people who drive around in armored cars with um, protection. They have all sorts of weapons. And every two feet, they have another guard. And they'll have a, a suburban behind them and a suburban in front of them. For what? When was the last time there was a major hit in New York City? You, you're what talking about for? Michael Bloomberg. Anybody. He's, I shook hands anybody. with him the other day at Union Square. I didn't even know really what he looked like. They just said Bloomberg, and everybody was pointing it around. I said, is that Mike Bloomberg? And, and I shook his hand. I said, can you help public access? Come on my show. He said, after November 3rd. So let's see what happens. Yeah, if, if he's not running for election, he might do it. But Because yeah. he likes to be in the limelight. But, but anyway, your, but your point is that, was it Mike Bloomberg? No, it wasn't him, but it's a lot of people. It could be him, it could be a lot of people. You don't need that type of protection in this city. Now, are there some cities that you may need that? Beirut, probably. But not here. But people have it. Isn't that sad about Beirut? Yeah. I heard Beirut was like the Switzerland of the Oh, Mediterranean. it was wonderful at one time. But, um, you know, it, it's just the idea that that's the culture they live in. So that's how they think. That's how they act, but just a second, and I that's like, how they love. But I like what you're saying, because economically, we're really going down. So Beirut, nobody probably would have thought what would happen happened there. So oh, maybe our positive anywhere. thinking can change this. Well, you need to think differently. Right. You, know? you, you need to think differently. Um, I love New York City. I don't want it to be like Beirut. Well, the one thing New York City has that no other city in the world has ever had the cultural diversity, and the constant influx of it. And it's a city of the world. It's not part of the United States, sorry. And Manhattan, more so than the other five boroughs. It's incredible, the diversity that comes through here. So it's always refreshed. It's like fresh fish coming in constantly. So no matter where you are, you can't be prejudiced because the person on your right's from this country, the one's on the right from it. And this one man the other day, I was at a, this little pizzeria, and I started talking to this man, and I was just curious. I was just having fun. 
And I said, uh, what's your ethnic background? He said, Babylonian. I said, Babylonian? <laughs> I said, I knew the Assyrians beat them in the Bible. I didn't know there were any around. I said, where is Babylonia? And he proceeded to tell me. And it where, was amazing. It, it, it overlaps Egypt and I think Iran and all these other countries over there, but it doesn't have distinct boundaries. I mean, the Babylonians know where their exact boundaries are. Isn't that interesting? But, and he says, no, I'm really Babylonian. And I says, wow. He said, uh, third generation in the United States, though. Hmm. I says, cool. And he ran a hedge fund. So I, I found him absolutely fascinating. But where else but the United States can we find that? And, you know, no one, it's, it's incredible. You know, my cousin graduated from Wharton. It's a business school. Sure. And he's, he's from Greece, and his brother went to Harvard, and, you know, the family goes abroad and gets educated. But he pointed out that at Wharton, out of, out of his graduating class, they came from all over the world, mm -hmm. but they would almost... I don't know, a huge percentage, 75% would go and work in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if the education that they're getting is really what the world needs. It's like even when you say hedge fund, I think it'd be nicer if we had, if we had more economic opportunities than, than that. It's, it's kind of a casino that, that's going on. And I think we shouldn't be afraid to look at that. If we do look at that, then I think we can get through that and see uh, more useful economic models, yeah. where we don't have to make the corporations the bad guys, but perhaps have capital ownership in it, because most of our wealth doesn't come from our labor, it comes from our capital ownership. Mm -hmm. So if we had capital ownership in technology, like, I don't know if you were picking up that DeAndre and I were talking about a very dynamic producer who's been working with cameras in the court. And this is such a mind-boggling advance in our technology that if you had a camera running all the time, who is most wanting the camera to be there and who's least wanting the camera to be there? The innocent will most want the camera to be there. Exactly. And the guilty the, will, will, will least want, want it. it. And the reason for the cameras in the courtrooms, just I, I don't think you mentioned this, but in every trial there is a stenographer who is taking down the court minutes. And what they do is the judge, like, will lift a finger or give certain, um, a certain sign to that stenographer to stop typing. Really? And uh, I was in a trial for several years, and in the beginning, I was ordering the court transcripts, and they didn't fool around with them in the beginning. They didn't realize I was getting evidence to write a book. So. I did get enough evidence to get the book out. But then after that, missing pages, pages, imp implicating the Manhattan DA's office, gone. I called up my lawyer. I said, all those questions you asked and the answers are not in the transcripts. And it happened over and over again. The last court hearing, the very last one, it was complete. They took out everything. All they did is, hello, yes, uh, okay, that's it. And it was like one page, and it should have been like 30 pages. So that's the reason, just so you could understand why Pozar is fighting for cameras in the courtroom, is because if you don't have cameras, your transcripts are being altered, erased. Well, what they were claiming is, is, that, is that you could do fakery with the cameras. And I said, they oh, you mean like on 9-11? Well. And they have to sit there and think about that one. But, oh, oh. but I mean, you can, you, you can keep, yeah, there's so many ways we can fool and cheat each other. But how can we get to a place where we love each other? Oh. <laughs> Got to trust. Got to trust? Okay. Were you trusting as a doctor before you made your transformation? Absolutely. Well, I, I, I wasn't trusting as a doctor. I was trusting before I went to medical school. Oh, really? In medical school, stamp trusting out oh, of you? Oh, absolutely. Really? It, it's really hard to get in medical school. How did you get in medical school? Uh, a lot of luck. Oh, it has to be genius as well. Don't be so modest. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people. There are 110 people applying for each position the year that I applied. That was luck, because there are a lot of qualified people who didn't get in. Do, do you think that they look for malleable people? No, yes. no, no offense. No, you're right. They do. They, they also look for... Uh, who your recommendations come from, who your family lineage is, 
uh, they have to fill their quotas. They have quotas, and they also, um, you know, they look at a whole array of things, but not all the things that are admirable to look at. You know, medical science could be the most divine science. It, it, it could touch divinity, where you bring the body and the spirit together. It should be the most noble art. And, and in, there are still vestiges of that, but I think they use that by kind of coercing the doctors. Then they grab the esteem that is rightfully due to the doctors. You must trust your doctor. They grab that, and then if the doctors have been sort of had it taken away, it, it's a horrible abuse, DeAndre. We know about all kinds of abuses, but this is, this is a big abuse against a man or but woman. It's like love. They didn't have it taken away. They gave it away. Hmm. Okay, elaborate. Well, no one can take anything from you if you don't give it away. So you gave it away in medical school? Sure. Was it a slow process of giving it away? No. They gave you an ultimatum. Give this up or, do, or you can't do this. Can't go to square two unless you give this up at square one. What did you have to give up? Your, your ability to be creative, free thinker, intuitive, um, spiritual. So once somebody told me he was, uh, he almost got a PhD in geology and then he dropped out even though he had a passion for the subject. And he said, you know what a PhD and a master's and a BA means? A BA means you can take this much shit, okay, you get a BA. Oh, you can take more, okay, you get a master's. Wow, you can take a whole heap, you get a PhD. But you know what? Maybe there is something to be said for the art of maneuvering through a lot of manure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or being able to use it to nourish your garden. So I, I think, I think, I, I, I admire what you've done, that you weathered Thank through you. that, and then you've continued in well, your I, search. I wasn't happy with it. I, I realized that uh, it wasn't what I wanted in the end. I didn't want to live a life like that. Do you have doctors reaching out to you to make transformations themselves? Absolutely not. No. Oh, that's sad. No. I mean. Uh, many doctors admire me, but they won't say it publicly. How about patients that cried when you left? Oh yeah, it would, it would, but, but the thing of it is too that, you know, uh, the people who make the most noise, even patients, there, there's, there's this thing about the savior, victim, martyr syndrome, and some of your most consistent, most, the patients that take most of your time are victims. And you are the savior, and they are going to make you the martyr. And there's a pathological triad there. What do you do? What do you do? First, you got to recognize it. And then you have to say no. You're giving away your power. Your job, you have to understand. In that life, seems a little ruthless. But I know. Well, it's not ruthless, it's reality. The thing of it is, is that when people pat you on the back and give you a lot of compliments, don't let that affect you very much. Yeah, I know. And when people shoot you down and say a lot of negative things about you, don't let that affect you too much either. It's right. your peer group. They're pulling you into line. They're ostracizing you when you don't listen, and they're pushing you, and, and they're pulling you in when you're doing what they want you to do. So it's like going to Washington and becoming a congressman today. I know exactly what I have to do to go to Washington and be a congressman. You have, have to lie, you have to steal, you yeah. have to manipulate yes. the public? Yes, you have to give away a lot of crumbs to uh, programs that should be cut back. And on the flip side, you have to give a lot of leeway to the people who are influencing you financially. So what can you do in Washington? Personally, I think nothing. Is that negative? No, it's reality. That's right. John F. Kennedy did what he could do for the people. So and what happened? Look what he, yeah. So they, they, will, they will eliminate you one they way or the other. They eliminated every single Kennedy. Yeah. But and, then what and keeps John, you going? And John, who wanted to go against Hillary, uh, bingo. Oh, plane crash, no black box. So, I mean, I mean, you have to you have to really be aware of, of what everything means. That doesn't mean that you're cold, and that doesn't mean you're insensitive. You're intuitive. 
Use your intuition. Your intuition will tell you when the compliment's real. Your intuition will tell you when what someone's saying about you that's negative is, God, I should really listen. I am a, I did screw up there. Look in the mirror. So right. the only guide you have is that inner voice. Can a doctor help you do that? Can or set doctor? the Because that's the feeling I got from Simon Gini's work, is that by breaking the doctor-patient relationship, a real family doctor would know the nuance of his patient and sort of help set the stage for him to do some soul-searching or cleansing, because it's from that level. If, if they're carrying a moral trauma, and they're not resolving that, that's going to express itself on the body. So maybe your the faith that people have in you, you, you give them a boost, your energy, you know. People have auras. If they have a healthy aura, it will lift everyone up that's in the aura. So as you lift them up, can you lift them up and then encourage them to look at what they might not want to look at that's causing them an assortment of problems? You have to be very careful because the bottom line today, you're working for a big organization, 99% of the time. And most doctors yes. that are not in private practice. There's very few private practitioners anyway. That's a thing of the past. Because they can't afford the insurance? It's just a, it's just a whole big enterprise today that doesn't work for it many It just many seems reasons. like we should just, just say no. It just seems so. You can't do it. You can't make it work anymore. I mean, I can't even get raw milk. You know, DeAndre, we've had a show on this. I craved raw milk today. I just knew that that was exactly what my body needed. And I couldn't, it's just I buy couldn't a cow. get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like getting drugs. You know, somebody, you know, there is an underground for raw milk, but it's expensive and you have to be introduced. And, and I didn't, you know, I wanted it right now. And you can get everything in Manhattan right now. You can probably get raw milk too if you knew the right Yeah, person. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Is it underground? But I, but I also like things milk. not being expensive because kind of being a public access producer and not getting paid for this. Um, you know, I'm trying to, I'm just, I keep saying one more season and I can make a difference and make it happen and get sponsors and people who will really have a passion for this. And you tend, you know, if you give negative news, people, they're kind of fascinated with it, but they, it, you, you kind of encourage a voyeurism. So maybe I should be listening to you. So you, you walked away from being a doctor. You just said, no more. I don't want to be the martyr because this person's a victim and he's going to, Make well, the me negative the energy savior? is incredible, especially in a small community. Sure, you can have a great following, but are you helping people? I mean, you really have to draw a line. They're and then, relying on you. Well, they're, they're relying. They're on controlling you. you. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. It's just like um, who's they, controlling you, the patient? Yeah. Or the, wow. C patients control the doctor. Because think about this. So you're at a major medical center in the city. And you're being loving and kind, but you're telling the truth. Well, patients are going to start writing. They're not getting what they want. They don't want to hear what you have to say. They want to hear what makes them feel good. Give me an example of something well, that a patient might not um, want to hear. But there's a person, that I, a patient that I knew, who was a very, uh, very successful celebrity, and said, um, I'm getting a colonoscopy. But I'm not drinking all that liquid stuff because my doctor knows I can't tolerate that. And I just, he gave me pills to take. Well, I've done hundreds of colonoscopies. You can't do them with pills. You're not clean. It's not an adequate study. But it won't this, be accurate. It won't be accurate. But this person's getting it because of who they are. And the doctor's afraid to get them upset because this person can make a lot of noise. The doctor's at a major center in this city. There's wow. another, another that, patient who was going to a psychiatrist in this city, very wealthy patient, and said, my psychiatrist is wonderful. You always have to watch when someone says how wonderful their doctor is. Uh, doctor You're must never, wonderful. Well, I'm not treating you. You might not <laughs> like me if I treated you. But, you know, it comes down to, it's not whether they're wonderful or not, it's whether they're good to you. They're, they're, they're Are they doing the job? They're doing their job. Said, um, he gives me all the Oxycontin I want. And I go, What's really? Oxycontin? It's a painkiller. Yeah, why would, why would your psychiatrist even write for a painkiller? 
for your emotional pain? Now, how does he get away with that? Because she wants it. And he knows he'll lose her as a patient. He can't lose her because she's paying him top dollar. It's about why, why go to the psychiatrist for 20 years? Right. right. What is he doing for you? Right. I mean, she's an annuity for him. And... And now she's addicted, obviously. Yeah. So she needs that drug. But you know, a lot of people, addicted. but people are in marriages in the same way. Yes. Yes, you know? sure. Yes. Absolutely. But, but it's the same thing with everything. It's relationships. It's all about relationships. I'm doing an um, interactive discussion, November 1st, in Union Square at the Tao Yoga and Tai Chi studio from 5 at night to 7. It's free. Everyone's welcome. Um, and it talks about the journey from love or from fear to love. One big choice, one very difficult choice people have the opportunity to make, and a bunch of little baby steps. And she's been going there for 20 years. And if she, he was good, she wouldn't need him for 20 years. He'd never cured her. First of all, why, why go to the psychiatrist for 20 years? Right. right. What is he doing for you? Right. I mean, she's an annuity for him. And... And now she's addicted, obviously. Yeah. So she needs that drug. But you know, a lot it's of people... Addicted. But people are in marriages in the same way. Yes. Yes. You know? Sure. Yes. Absolutely. But, but it's the same thing with everything. It's relationships. It's all about relationships. What type of relationship do you want in life? You can choose. Here's your platter of relationships. You can choose. You know, I, I just want to ask you something. You said that when you were going to medical school, you, you realized, you know, there was something not so kosher. Right. It's funny because it's the opposite with law school. The law students aren't told the truth, and they don't really learn how corrupt the system is until after they graduate. Mm -hmm. And then they be, I met a couple of lawyers that passed and members of the bar, but quit. Mm -hmm. Like, like in quit. the first year or second year. Well, Joe Friendly was that way. He passed his, his law school stuff. Oh, so there you go. So I didn't Did know you pass the bar, Joe? Oh, we have to wrap it up. <laughs> I must. He passed the uh, competence part. He passed the competence part, and then he thought he could sort of uh, just do name changes. He thought that. He could morally. I must say this really quickly. One of the greatest books out there for anyone, regardless of profession, the book called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. It's excellent. Oh, wow. Well, it's thank excellent. you, ladies That's and gentlemen. Sick. This is Paula Gloria, and this has been an episode farther down the rabbit hole with DeAndrea and Dr. Joe Quirtzi. Quirtzi. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Dr. John. Right. Um, just, just let the tapes roll a few minutes. I know we're over. 537. Oh, can you just stay for two minutes? Two minutes. Talk about conversations with God, because I want my person to see this, and I want them to hear you, too. Okay, what happened was my former husband is very has very powerful connections in the district attorney's office, and the district attorney's office controls the judges. Judges are just puppets on a string. So he was able to not have to pay me child support. He was able to not have to pay my daughter support. He was able to imprison my daughter into state custody for five years, even though the federal law says you can't keep a Quick, child. Quick, two minutes. I want to get oh, to okay. the part, conversations with God. So anyway, I'm in jail, and I'm sitting over a typewriter, and I'm crying, and the tears are flowing into the typewriter without exaggeration. So a civilian who had been watching me for over a period of three months doing this every day, standing up before I would start typing, first I'm just bawling. So she came over, she called me in actually, to her office, and she says, you know, I don't know who you are and I don't know what your case is about, but what I do sense, she's highly spiritual, this woman. She says, you don't belong here. Well, could you explain your case to me? So I did. And she handed me this book, which was Conversations with God. Mm -hmm. She said, please read this. I'm not allowed to give any prisoners anything, so please hide it. So I concealed it with my other legal papers, and I brought it into my cell, and I start reading it, and I go, oh, my God, 
this is real. This is my new Bible. This is, I couldn't put it down. I, I stayed up all night around the clock until I became so physically exhausted I had to close my eyes. And then there was a bang on the door for breakfast, <laughs> so I never slept that first night. So I called up a friend of mine. I said, I have to return this book that was lent to me, but this is going to be my Bible. So please send me, you know. So I got, I got the book through the mail. And I was able, any time I was just about to feel that pain of what I was going through, I picked up the book and would just open any page and read. And I was like, oh, okay, God, I have faith. This is just a moment, a temporary moment. I'm going to be out of this. But that was my experience with that book. It is the person who wrote it. I believe him. His answers came from God. I believe him. Because the difference between conversations with God and the Bible is there are all kinds of contradictions it's in the two Bible. Let, let, can you make a comment on this? The, the Bible is contradictory. Mm -hmm. Conversations with God doesn't have one contradiction in it. And it's a trilogy, by the way. Go on. No, I, I, I'm familiar with it. it. It's very good. I mean, it's, it's very good. It's whatever uh, inspires you. Uh, and, and that's definitely a very inspiring book. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. But. It's just sort of the idea that we're going to change the world by lifting ourselves up spiritually. Sure. This, this happened to have triggered her. Other people will have other things, but the whole yeah. phenomenon can take a bleak situation. I'm just curious your comments. Yeah. No, I mean, you change the world one person at a time. Great. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for joining me. I'll take yes. Oops. Great. Take care. Bye. Joe, so do you want to jump on and as the cam as the tapes roll out? Just just get mic'd here and give your comments. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I'll be in touch with you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. And thank you, Paul Gloria, for having me on the program. So, Joe, let's do a little wrap up here. No, no, no. No, just keep your mic on. What do you think of those shows, Joe? You've known DeAndre for a while. And what I'm hearing is that um, there are authentic moments in our lives when we finally get in touch. And it was beautiful to see you on camera when you came alive that I got it, you know. <laughs> and uh, the doctor has by now a sense when he's achieved that with his patient and uh, we are living in inauthentic times, and so there are just moments when we're authentic, and uh, those are to be cherished, and the idea is to uh, somehow change society so that we can be there 100% of the time, <laughs> and we got a ways to get there. Now, and you felt public access, because you came from Chicago, didn't you, to get involved here? I had faith in public access in the sense of, um, those moments when I felt so lucid and I felt like the whole world should listen to what I just figured out just that moment <laughs> and maybe I can get on a roll and so I think it is um, wonderful that we now have achieved that with YouTube that if you feel the call if you feel uh, God's voice is uh, channeling or whatever you have an opportunity to uh, see how many hits you get. <laughs> have you done that? Have you had those um, lucid moments? Have you posted them? Yes and no, actually. I, I tried one um, direct blog-in, whatever you call it. Uh, I forgot the name for that, but a direct upload. And uh, I limited it to a viewership of one. I haven't... <laughs> I haven't well, you know, public. DeAndre was getting two and a half thousand hits a day. Uh -huh. And then they changed the search engines. It would have been, it really, it easily could have been 100,000 a day. What kind of tags? It was about sexual abuse. They were going to YouTube and putting in sexual abuse, and uh -huh. 